Well, good afternoon, everyone. I am Michael Steelman, Director of Alumni Career Management and Professional Networks at William Mary. And I'm truly delighted to welcome you to our first ever virtual fireside chat. Today's conversation is made possible by the support of the William Mary Alumni Association as we seek to provide relevant programming for our lifelong commitment to our alumni. So today's conversation is being recorded and we will notify all registrants once the recording is available. Um, I will be monitor, uh, monitoring Q&A, so please do uh, type in some questions. I will also uh, have a few questions lined up for our guest presenter uh, and guest speaker. Um, now, without further ado, I would like to invite um, our, our guest speaker to join us and do a little quick intro. Uh, Dr. Lee Savio Beers is the president-elect of the American Academy of Pediatrics an associate professor of pediatrics and the medical director for community health and advocacy at Children's National Hospital. She is the founding director of the DC Mental Health Access and Pediatrics Program and co-director of the Early Childhood Innovation Network. She also oversees the Child Health Advocacy Institute's Community Mental Health Corps, a private a public private coalition that serves as a catalyst to elevate the standard of mental health care for every young person in Washington, DC. She earned, she earned her undergraduate degree from her very own William & Mary, her medical degree from Emory University School of Medicine, and completed a pediatric residency at the Naval Medical Center in Portsmouth, Virginia. Prior to joining Children's National, she was a general pediatrician at the Naval Hospital in Guantanamo, Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, and the Naval, National Naval Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland. She received the Academic Pediatric Association's 2019 Public Policy and Advocacy Award. She serves in a wide variety of leadership and advi advisory positions within the Washington, D.C. community. Her clinical and research interests include adolescent pregnancy and parenting, the integration of mental health and pediatric primary care, the impact of adversity and stress on child well-being and advocacy education. She lives in Washington, D.C. area with her husband, Nathaniel, and two children. Lee, we are truly delighted to welcome you today. Thank you for joining us for this important conversation as we all, those that are parents watching today are, are struggling a little bit, uh, are happy that we're with our kids at this time, um, but certainly would welcome your expertise and advice um, as a parent of two young uh, children, uh, four and almost two. Um, I've enjoyed our, our email chats back and forth to plan today and uh, know there are many questions from our audience. I will start with a few that I've been sort of asking my wife and, and neighbors who are parents uh, to, to kind of think about. But um, one of the things that I would like to begin with, given your specialty in mental health, is to really talk about um, some of the ways that we speak to children mm -hmm. about the situation that we are dealing with, whether it's the grief of loss, the um, ability to not um, do things that they used to be doing, and also sort of, you know, this idea of the virus itself. How do you advise that we best present that to children in different stages of different ages? Uh, no, it's a really important question. And first, thank you. Um, I'm really delighted to be here um, talking with, with uh, you and many of my former classmates and colleagues and, 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 and fellow alumni. So I really appreciate the opportunity today. And, you know, it, it really, it is, it, it is a very difficult thing. I think, you know, one of the first things is just to acknowledge your own stress and fears about the circumstances we're in right now and about um, coronavirus, the COVID-19. Um, you know, I think it's it's important for us to understand what our own fears are about it before we start to talk to our kids. And when we start to talk to our kids about it, there's a couple of things that I think are important to remember. You know, one is you want to be honest. Don't, don't, don't try to hide it. Don't try to pretend something else is going on. Honesty and transparency is always important. Depending on how old your child is, you're going to approach it in different ways. Um, for younger kids, it may be as simple as saying, you know, there's there's a, a, a virus, a type of cold infection that's going around. And, and um, for most people, it's not a serious infection, but for some people, it can be a serious infection. And so we're all working together to try to make sure our community stays healthy. And that's why we have to do some things a little bit differently. Older kids are gonna have, you're gonna have different levels of conversation with older kids because they're gonna have a deeper understanding. They, they may wanna know more about what this really is and why. And, 
um, they also have more access to news and social media and maybe seeing and hearing things that they have questions about. Um, so some of that with, with your older kids is really talking to them and saying, what kind of things have you been hearing? What questions do you have? Are there things you're worrying about? Are there things that, that, that you have questions about and going from there? Terrific, and, and thank you for that wonderful opening advice. Um, so as a reminder, for those that are joining us, go ahead and scroll over the, the um, window and you'll see a Q&A icon. And that's where you can type in your questions and I'll look at that uh, throughout the next half an hour or so and um, take any questions from anybody. So I, I have a long list, but I'm happy to uh, specific, you know, use uh, questions from the, the audience as well. Um, so screen time. I, I, I know your colleagues of AAP are, are, are certainly um, uh, proponent, uh, proponents of avoiding the screen time, and there's no way to avoid it today, as education has become through the screen uh, for those that are old enough to do so. And even my daughter's circle time is now using Zoom. Um, what, would you, what would you and your colleagues say right now is, is something to think about, you know, and how to best sort of balance the, the need for it with the advice of your expertise? Right. Well, I think it's a, it's a really good question. It's probably one of the most common questions I get. And I think the, the, the first piece of advice is that these are not normal times. Um, if, if it, it, it might make you and, and uh, everyone listening feel better to know that I, I did a presentation not that long ago about um, the American Academy of Pediatrics response to coronavirus. And one of the slides I used was a screenshot of a tweet that said, I, I know one piece of medical advice I won't be following during the pandemic, and it's the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendation about screen time. So, so understand, we, it, this is, these are not normal times. And so we have to think a little bit differently about screens and technology. And frankly, screens are the, and technology are how we have connectedness now with each other. Um, and that's really important both for adults and for kids. And so we have to think about that a little bit. So I, I think some general guidance is, again, try to keep it less for the younger kids. You know, we can tolerate a little more for the older kids. Um, you know, know and understand much of the much of your online schooling for kids who are school age is going to be virtual. It's going to be on screens, and that's okay. That's that's okay. That is what it is for right now. Um, when you think about the time on screens outside of online learning, think about a couple of things. Think about one: how do you use it? constructively and how do you use it for positive things? So, you know, can you use it for connectedness with friends and classmates? Um, can you use it to watch things together as a family so that you're, you're using that as a tool to interact with each other? Um, and think about sort of also it's okay, you know, all of us, including our kids, need a little downtime. And so it's okay to use it for a little downtime sometimes. Now, the flip side of that is also make sure you're sort of scheduling it, right? Make sure or, or putting, not necessarily scheduling, but putting, putting some guidelines on how much you can use it outside of, outside of your academics. Um, so, so think that through as a family, try to get some buy-in from your kids on that, and then also make the time and schedule non-screen time activities. Um, it's, it's easy to forget to do that, but, but blocking out a little time or committing to yourselves that you're all going to go for a walk or a bike ride or play a board game or do something, have dinner together as a family that's not in front of a movie, you know, do things like that to make sure you're carving, carving that, that time out. Uh, one, one, before I get to this great question um, from a one participant, but I wanted to uh, ask a little follow up to that last point about getting outside a little bit of the um, sort of right. advice that you are having with whether CDC following, but also the reality that it's important for kids to exercise. It's important for adults to get some exercise. And for many urban environments, you don't have the backyard space or you don't have the quiet sidewalks. Um, what uh, what are you suggesting in cities like DC, New York, other metropolitan um, areas where people may be in two bedroom, three bedroom apartments, one bedroom apartments with their children? Uh, you know, there's only so much square footage that you can be creative with their uh, loops and circles and things. And and this is of all ages. I think there's a certainly high schoolers that were athletes that now are told to not go on runs or not go biking. What are you advising? Um, parents and uh, doing with with regards to that for their own exercises, but also for their children. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's, I think it's a really good question. And I, we were just talking about this, you know, I, I live in the city as well in DC. So this is something we've really, and have two school age kids who are pretty active. And so, you know, this is something we've really thought through ourselves in our own house. I think, I, I think a couple of guidelines, um, you do want to practice social distancing when you're outside. Um, it's that said, it's really important, I think, for all of us to get outside and get a little physical activity and get a little fresh air. And so thinking about how you can do that safely, um, you all probably know this, the CDC has recommended um, mask wearing when you're outside for kids two and up. Um, and I think that's important. I do think it's important. It's going to help. It's going to help decrease the spread of the virus um, and help protect others. Um, so that that's a really important piece. I'll I'll say my kids weren't super excited about that when we implemented it <laughs> in our house, um, but we worked to maybe you know my my mother-in-law is making us some masks with fabric that they approve of and things like that. So you know there there are things you can work with, but I do think that's important. Um, one of the other things that we've found is really helpful. Um, in our area is try to get out at not peak times. Um, so five o'clock at night tends to be when it seems like everybody's going out and walking their dog and going for runs. And so trying to time our times out at a little bit different time, thinking about what, what path we're gonna take, what street we're gonna go on, and then just being gracious and considerate when you're out. You know, if you're walking down a sidewalk, move to the side a little bit, um, you know, make space for folks when, when you're out and about. So, but I do think it is really important to get outside and get that fresh air. It's, it's um, you know, one of the ways that we will all stay healthy during this time is by keeping our bodies healthy and, and exercise and good nutrition is a part of that. Certainly the mental health aspect too, of getting yeah. some fresh air and sunshine yeah. and and so forth. And I, I will say, you, you mentioned this a little bit on the fabric choice. I, I, I kid you, but my um, daughter, we were going through the mask making process um, that the Surgeon General put that wonderful 40 second video. Uh, very easy. I will say the rubber bands don't work as effectively probably as, as really tied string, but my personal experience there. But I, I let her choose what what fabric. So we actually found like an old onesie from, you know, years back with a bunny on it. So how appropriate around the Easter time to put together you know, so have fun with it with your children is what I've experienced. So I think that you did that as well. So thank you for that advice. So we have um, a couple great questions going that I really want to get to. Um, uh, one uh, from uh, newborn, uh, mm -hmm. newborns and sort of, um, uh, you know, the area of caring for newborns in this time. There are several alumni that have recently been blessed with great new children and we want them to be healthy and happy throughout this. And uh, in particular, during this, the routine vaccines and um, uh, with not being administered until two months checkup and so forth, what is being discussed among your peer group and how to best handle that with your pediatricians and so forth? Yeah, it's a really important question. I'm glad glad you asked. I think there there's a couple pieces to it. I think you mentioned the vaccines. Um, it, it is so important for kids to continue to get their routine vaccines during this time. I mean, as I've you know reminded many, the, the absolute last thing we need right now is a vaccine preventable, an outbreak of a vaccine preventable disease, and we want your kids and your babies to be as healthy as possible. You know, through, through my role with the American Academy of Pediatrics, I have the chance to sort of learn what folks across the country are doing. And the vast majority of pediatricians offices are making modifications so that they can carve out space and time for well visits um, that are separate from urgent care or acute visits. And, and folks are being very, very careful about managing infection control in their offices. Um, so I can tell you for in my, I practice at Children's National in the, in the pediatric, well, pediatric outpatient clinic there. Um, I was actually just there um, Wednesday seeing, seeing my, our well baby clinic. And so we've divided up, we have two separate ends of the clinic, totally different check-ins, um, completely different separate providers. So I was actually only the oldest baby, the oldest child I saw um, when I was in clinic earlier this week was four months old. Um, and so, and they were all healthy. And so we were really working to make sure that kids could get in for their newborn visits um, and get in for those early visits where they need immunizations. And so I think that's, that's one really important point. Um, and everybody's, all, you know, everybody, I know folks on the call are from all over the country. So just call your pediatrician's office and ask them what they're doing it and how they're managing it so that you can get in for your well visits most safely. 
Um, I think the same thing holds for newborns, right? Because they may not be coming in for well visits, but it's really important for us to be seeing them and making sure they're gaining weight and they're not jaundiced and all of those other pieces. Um, many practices are also doing telemedicine. Um, and so we can <laughs> take a peek over video if there's a question or a concern so that you, you know, we can do an initial um, eyeball to see if this is something that we really want you to come in for. Um, sometimes we do need to see you in the office and, and we're, we're, we're all working to make that, make that as absolutely safe as possible. Um, you know, I think parents also worry a little bit just about being home with a newborn <laughs> during this time. Um, you know, it's, it's already a time that you, you worry about your baby, you worry that they might be vulnerable to things, and then with all of these other pieces going along, um, it's, it can be really hard. Um, it's, 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 it can be really hard. You know, so I think a couple of things to reassure there. One is, you know, I've shared this with a couple <laughs> of the parents who I saw earlier this week. Um, you know, when you're home with a newborn, you're kind of just home hunkering down anyway. And so, so was everybody else right now. So, so everybody's hanging out at home and, and, and you do the same. Um, it is okay to get out with your baby, but again, try to time it in such a way where there's not a lot of people around. Um, uh, for folks who have the like little carriers that they, the, you know, the, the carriers that come up against your chest um, or the slings, that might be a nice way to get out with your baby so that you can keep them close into you um, and avoid potential, potential infection. So, so that's it too. And then I would say the final thing, particularly for parents of newborns, um, you know, that's a time when, when um, you know, you might be vulnerable to, to postpartum depression or postpartum mood or anxiety disorders. And all the things that are going on now are only going to heighten that risk and concern. So don't hesitate to reach out to someone if you're, if you're feeling sad or down or worried about things. And maybe at the end of the conversation, there might be some resources, websites that you can uh, share with us and we'll, we'll, I can also, you can send them to me and I can send them in the follow-up emails to those that have uh, registered for today. Um, you know, and, and certainly I think caring for ourselves is also really important, even as, you know, the, the you know, we want to do as everything we can for our children, but, you know, we have to be caring for ourselves well as well. And uh, it's almost like that airplane thing where you put the mask on first before you put it on the children so that you can be the best healthy person for them. Um, how would you recommend helping a senior in high school who is now dealing with a lot of the traditions that they were excited to, to have in the springtime and to the end of the, you know, high school experience, this, the, the proms, the sporting events, the graduation. How are you and your peers, college, you know, discussing this and, and working with kids that age? Yeah, it's so hard. I mean, I think that's just, again, first out acknowledging it's, it's, it's hard. Um, you know, my, I have a daughter who's in high school and she's actually a freshman, but, but, but we've had that conversation. She said, gosh, mom, I'm so glad that I'm not a senior right now because I would be really sad about that. Um, and so first off, just like I've been saying all along, you know, really acknowledging that it is normal to feel a sense of loss over, over the things that you're going to be missing in your senior year. Um, as a parent, you know, by the time your child gets to senior year, you kind of have been through adolescent and you've seen, you know, how adolescents respond to feelings of emotion and it's not always the most constructive thing, but sometimes it is. So acknowledging as a parent and knowing that, that your teenager, they're gonna have some moments, right? They're gonna lash out, they're gonna be mad, they're not gonna know how to express their emotions um, and, and being a little patient and letting, letting that happen. Um, but I think, you know, there, there's other things you can do. So one, you know, just be continually talking to your teen about it. Acknowledge, as I said, that, you know, this is a tough time and, and how are you feeling about it? Thinking about what are some of the things that you can do to, to it, it'll never replace it, but what are some of the things you can do to make this end of the year special? Um, there are virtual things you can do. There's things you can plan for down the line, but just thinking about what, what are some other ways you can make this time special for your team? Um, and, 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 and again, reassuring them that this is, this is hard and they're gonna really feel the loss of this, but there will be many other special occasions and many other special times in their future that they will get to experience. Um, and just to remember, that. Wonderful. Um, so the question I'm going to ask a little more of humor, but um, should we be concerned that our children are now having fake 
make believe conference calls with headsets <laughs> and computers. And I, I hope that gives a smile to some of the viewers today. But I, I say that as humor, but also as a serious, you know, sort of what are we, I, I'm noticing more and more as younger, you know, four year olds, five year olds follow their parents and like to mimic and pretend words and things like that. And I'm noticing this, and my wife and I were discussing this the other day. And is, is there, you know, concerned on that? Or, you know, are you, are you okay? It's kind of a fun way that they can now pretend they're working and, and keep them occupied while we're all on Zoom calls. Yeah, no, it's totally okay. It's 100% okay. I mean, it, I mean, one, that's a very developmentally normal thing for kids that age to do, um, you know, for folks who, who are working outside of the home and then are, are you know, home at other times, they'll, they'll notice, or folks who are working inside the home, you know, you, your, your kids imitate what you do and what, what they see you do. So, um, you know, it may be that they're, you know, imitating you sweeping the floor or, or gardening with you, or now when, when, when many of us are home on almost continuous Zoom calls, this is the thing they're seeing us do and they're gonna imitate it and that's okay. Um, one thing actually to think about that is kind of a neat thing to do during this time is it's almost a nice opportunity to let your kids into your life a little bit um, and they can see what it is that you do when you're gone for the day um, and they can learn a little bit more about um, what what your days look like and what why you're doing it and um, uh, what what who some of your work peers are who some of the people are who you interact with outside of of of, of your home life. And so, so think about it as a time to, to, to let your kids get to know you a little bit better and let them get to know what, what, who you are and what kind of things you do when you're not at home and with them. Funny you say that as my daughter literally walks into the room unplanned, <laughs> but it's almost bring your children to work day every day almost and, and have fun with it as opposed to over, over oh, concern. There she, is. Uh, there she is. Well, we are alive. Yes, we are. Uh, there, there's, there's the story of my life. Uh, it's been, I, I did not plan that everyone, uh, but uh, that happens as you all have probably had happen at some point. Most of my colleagues by now have one, one viewing of my daughter or some in the, in the meetings. So well, oh, give me one minute, please. Uh, okay, so um, a couple questions about the medical information and misinformation in particular. How do you think we should be handling this in an age where it's so easy to access essential, inf you know, infinite information on the internet? And where are you directing your clients and, and patients and so forth to go and your peers are sending people? Where's the best place right now that we should be following for parenting par pediatricians advice? Yeah. yeah, that's also a really important question. And, and I'm sure you, like I have, have seen all sorts of stuff floating around on the internet. Um, and, and that's natural, right? I mean, there, there is a lot that we still don't, I mean, there's a lot we do know and, and quite a bit that we do know about, about COVID, um, but there's, there are things we don't know. Um, and so it is very normal to really trying to be think about how do I best protect myself and my family? Um, on, on the same, but with the same vein, it's really important for that information to be factual and science-based. Um, and so, so you're exactly right. I, I tend to, I tend to, to direct people to, to a few websites that I think are really good sources of information. Um, you know, of course, the American Academy of Pediatrics website, um, there is the, the, the main website, which is typically for medical professionals, but has, it has good information there um, that's accessible to the public. There's also um, our website for parents and families, um, and that is healthychildren.org, also has a lot of great information that we're updating on a really regular basis um, based on, on whatever new information is coming out. Um, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, of course, is also a very good website. Um, and that will direct you to some other places as well. You know, and I would also say there's other stuff out there and sometimes it's really good, good information. I think it's one of the really nice things that I'm seeing during this time is that the medical community and mental health community and community and, and, and community serving agencies are really coming together to try to pull a lot of helpful information. Um, and so you can almost sometimes feel a little overwhelmed with the amount of information that's coming at you. Um, so if you see something and you're not sure if it's if it's accurate, you're not you're not sure if it's science based. Call your doctor and talk to them about that. That's what we're here for, um, you know. And and and. 
And in fact, many of our pediatricians' offices aren't that busy right now. This isn't an illness that tends to make children very ill, and we are, you know, working hard to minimize the exposure. And so we're switching lots of visits, as I said, to telemedicine and other things. So our pedi your pediatricians are there, um, and so give them a call and ask them. Like I've read this, you know, I don't know what to think about it. Um, um, what should I do? You know, but I think as a general statement, um, some of the things are take care of yourself. I mean, it's all, all the stuff grandma tells us, right? Take care of yourself, eat healthy when you can, but be kind to yourself if you have a bad day and eat a lot of potato chips or something. So, cause that's normal too. Um, uh, get out, get some movement, get some exercise, wash your hands reasonably frequently. You don't have to wash them every 20 minutes. That's probably not practical um, and, and, and certainly not necessary. Wipe your surfaces down a little bit more frequently, but don't drive yourself crazy running around the house, wiping everything down. So, um, you know, really just back to the basics, taking care of yourself, eating well, doing your best to get a good night's sleep um, and getting some exercise and fresh air. Great. Apologize for the interruptions, as, as I was, but I was listening. It was, it was, we couldn't have time planned that. I, I, I did not plan on that, um, and sorry about that. But but no, no, I, I mean, always enjoy. Older and they do it too. So <laughs> I just think back to that um, video a year ago where the guy was doing that interview and and uh, on BBC, I think it was, and and that was a, a viral sensation. And um, uh, back to a couple questions here about you kind of touched on this a little bit about um, not trying to scare or not to try to keep, create too much cleaning, too much this and that. In particular, how about like running up to children? I mean, it's so hard to, yeah. you know, a child loves to see their friends. And if they are, you know, even if they're half a block away, you know, how are you not scaring them and, and, and almost causing a longer term concern of them not socializing with their friends after this situation, right? You know, how do we, you know, get them to the point where they're still comfortable going up to their friends when we all can be not social distancing anymore. Right. Yeah, it's, and, and I think this is, well, it's, it, I think it's hard for the little ones. I think it's also hard for the teenagers who are, are not always good at sort of thinking long-term. So, um, <laughs> but, but I think a couple of things, I mean, I think really talking to your kids ahead of time, trying to sort of prep them for this and reminding them of it on a, on a regular basis, just that, you know, um, you know, right, again, back to what I was saying earlier, really focusing in on we're really trying to protect all of our neighbors and we're trying to protect people around us um, and, and reminding them that part of that protecting them is trying to make sure we don't share the virus. And what that means is that right now we can't give each other hugs and shakes um, you can't wrestle on the ground for the little ones or some of the bigger ones too, I guess, um, you know, but, but, but that we'll be able to go back to doing that soon. But for right now, we're really working to keep each other safe and we're working to take care of each other. And it's going to be normal that kids are going to forget that in the moment. So just give them a gentle reminder. And like, remember, honey, you know, this is what we talked about. We're trying to keep each other safe. Um, and so we're not going to give each other hugs, but teach them to do other things, right? They can wave at each other. They can make faces at each other. They can, you know, blow each other a kiss from a, like, well, social distance. Um, but, but just, you know, we're, we're giving them other ways to share um, uh, their affection for their friends and just reminding them that this is so that we can take care of our whole community. And this is so we can take care of all of our friends and all of our neighbors and all of our family. Wonderful. And I think we have time for a few more questions. Are you okay if we go keep going? Great. Um, and uh, this is almost less pediatric focused solely, but uh, is it safe to eat takeout? Are you uh, supportive of the ways that um, the sort of process that many of us have run out of cooking options at home and in urban environments, there's great delivery services now for uh, some of our local favorites to still keep them afloat and also get some food to our tables. What are you um, hearing from your medical expertise from your peers and uh, about the, the virus potential with that and risk there? Yeah, I think for all that we can tell, it really is safe to eat takeout. We're, we're doing it in our own family. I mean, as you said, it breaks up the monotony a little bit. It's a good way to support support our neighborhood businesses. You know, I think I think there's a couple things to to remember, right? You know, one is is 
you know, the, the virus is spread through respiratory droplets, right? So, I mean, like any time, you know, whenever we come in and out of our house or pick up something from outside the house, we wash our hands afterwards. Um, and that's fine. You know, that that's a good thing. Um, but, 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 but it's, it's, you know, um, uh, uh, the virus isn't going to be transmitted through the food necessarily. So, so it's very safe to do that. And I, I think, you know, most restaurants by and large, the, the vast majority of them are, are really being overly cautious as well. Uh, and so I think it's, it's completely fine. So, and we're doing it in our own house, if that makes anyone feel any better. So we're, we're doing that as well. So I think you could talk a little bit about Children's Hospital and their supply of medical supplies for you and your colleagues. Um, and, you know, obviously the news has been heavy in sort of this, you know, the information has been mostly about the, the lack of ventilators concern, mm -hmm. the issues that may exist. What are you noticing from uh, right now? Are, are you finding that we are okay right now? Is there anything that the, you know, community can be doing to help? What are some of the things that uh, you're seeing from a medical supply standpoint for you and your colleagues? Yeah, thank you for asking that. It, it is it, it is an issue. Um, we, we, we don't have all the what we're calling PPE, personal protective equipment that we need. Um, it does vary a little bit by region um, and by hospital, right? Um, to areas that are uh, harder hit are using more. Um, supply is a little bit uneven. Um, so, so this is definitely an issue. Um, I would say a couple of things, you know, I can speak from our own experience at Children's National here in DC. Um, you know, we've, we, we've, I've been very grateful. Um, our hospital has been from the very beginning really being thinking very carefully about what we have and how we're using it um, and, and how we're distributing it to make sure that our staff are safe and thus in turn our patients are safe. Um, so uh, that said, there, there, there are national shortages. Um, so I think there's a couple of things that, that I would recommend for those of you on the call to think about. One is if you have any, any we, we had this like wonderful surprise. We did ultimately find out who left it for us, but we went out to walk the dog the other night and discovered a giant bag full of 195s on our porch. Um, and no, no, we didn't know where they came from. They were new boxes. So we took them and we took them into the hospital. Someone knew who we were, you know, knew, knew where we worked. Um, so if you have you know, N95s or, or other PPE that you're able to share with your local hospital or doctor's office, do so, please. Um, most local hospitals um, and health centers, if you go to their websites, will have information about how you can help support them. There are ways to make donations to your local hospital or financial donations where they can then purchase the equipment. Um, there's also many hospitals are taking donations of cloth masks. Um, which are not necessarily used by the medical providers, but, but often can be used for patients when they come into the hospital to help decrease the spread. Um, so there's lots of different things you can do. Um, I would encourage everyone to, to, to look into their, their regional hospital or pediatric practice or other medical practices and, and find out what it is that they need to see if you can help. Wonderful, great family activity too, to yeah. get them learning how to sew and uh, yeah. do some good things for great people. Yeah. Um, and, and on that note, I mean, we are truly grateful for you and your colleagues and the healthcare community frontline in all of this. Um, you know, it's just, uh, it's amazing to watch and read the stories of our heroes in, in the, you know, from everyone from the, the, you know, ambulance team to the, the physicians in, in the hospitals. Uh, working crazy hours on very limited and and doing it with their own risk and and we applaud you the whole William Mary community applauds you and everyone in the William Mary community that's part of that because you are helping so many people and um, the key for all of us is to kind of follow the rules and and help you all so you you're healthy and uh, you can do your your amazing talented uh, magic that you do. Um, Thank you. And actually, if I could also add, you know, it's not just the medical providers in our in our hospitals and and health clinics. It's our environmental services folks, our our uh, front desk folks, um, you know, people doing registration. It's really it takes everybody, and and um, th those sometimes are folks who don't get the the same recognition, but the work they do is just as important. So. Absolutely, the entire team, and uh, there's so many people, um, and so it, it just is a sign of the amazing community that we do have and the positives of this world, and and I think that. Um, 
you know, is similar to what I've noticed in the William Mary community over four years I've been a part of it, but certainly in the past couple of weeks, the, the alumni that have stepped up to help, to throw, you know, throw their hat in, you know, name in to help with where they can, um, to offer ideas and expertise like you today. But um, certainly for those of you that are interested in helping and sharing your expertise to others in the William Mary community during this time, we have a whole website um, ready to take submissions. We can't necessarily do everything every day, but we will look through and try to plan out uh, activities throughout the weeks in ahead um, to keep everyone engaged and supportive to one another. Um, and uh, maybe uh, one, one last question as we close things out, and, 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 and I don't mean it to be sound like a negative or concerning, but I think every question of this is kind of a little concerning, right? Um, but sort of where do you see the long-term setback that is developing both with the learning of an education front and some other anxiety issues that might develop? Um, and you know, in particular with the learning, you know, we have children that at all different stages of, of you know, development and, uh, you know, even for the higher ed entering classes, you know, that now are going to be all virtual senior year and now going into college and, uh, but, you know, early on education, it, you know, it's only so these are teachers that were not trained in online learning are now quickly doing amazing work to get uh, you know, parents up to speed to help their children and do it together. But what is sort of the, the sort of long-term concerns or, you know, are we going to be okay? Where do you see some concerns or red flags that you and your colleagues are discussing? Yeah, no, thank you for that. And it, it is, it's a, it's a hard, you know, a, a sort of um, difficult thing to think about, but I think there's also some positive things we could all think about doing together that, that can help with it. I think, so I would say a couple of things. I think, you know, it, it's not ideal for our kids to not be in school right now, right? Um, it is what it is, but it's it's not ideal. That said, they're all in the same place and, and our school systems are and our teachers are working hard to, to keep things moving and they will have the chance to check to, to catch up, right? We, 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 our kids will get back to school. They will get back into the learning. There, there may be gaps sometimes, but we'll catch up with those gaps. Um, where I actually worry is for our kids who are living in families um, that are a little bit more vulnerable, um, that, that are experiencing a lot of economic insecurity right now, um, that may be experiencing adversity or trauma in, in their own households. Um, and those kids I worry about. Um, those, those, those kids I definitely worry about because, because for, for a family who has pretty good resources and pretty stable households, um, we're going to, you know, my own kids are going to be fine. Um, it's not going to be a perfect semester, but they're going to be fine. Um, but, but, but I do worry about the kids in our community who are living in, in, in more difficult situations. But I think that's what we all can do as a community is really think, to, to think about how can we reach out and help? Um, how can we make sure families who are experiencing economic hardship get food? Um, how can we make sure that they have diapers for their babies? How can we make sure, um, you know, we've been doing some work here in DC uh, around some of the virtual learning because many of our families that we take care of don't have technology in their house and or don't have internet. Um, so we've been working to get technology into the houses. We've been working to get um, them signed up for free internet so that they can access all these things available. We've been working to figure out ways to virtually check in with families. Um, so think about what the things you can do in your own community that can help those who may be um, in, a, in a more difficult situation. Um, because I think it is, it is a hard time and, and we are gonna be thinking about this for, 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 for months if not years to come. Um, how do we support um, those kids who are in households where where things are a little bit more difficult. Um, we can do it, but it's going to require us all coming together and working together and really thinking about how we support support um, all the kids and families in our communities. Absolutely. And that you, you took what I thought was a very um, difficult mm -hmm. question to conclude with, but made it hopeful, optimistic, and really community um, you know, the, the role of community in all of this. And I will, I will say, uh, since this is a William Mary audience, um, William Mary as a university has set up some really great opportunities to support the student needs today, those that are 
are dealing with some of the financial challenges and economic issues that you were talking about. So certainly for alumni that are watching and want to help, there's a great um, way to do so. And you know, we will be there for our alumni community. So if you want to anonymously email, I'm happy to be sort of a recipient, but others and my t uh, colleagues across the alumni community, we're here for you all. If you want, we'll figure out ways to channel news out to others to help um, and be connectors for you all. So. Um, you know, speak up to, you know, us, we'll, we'll keep the anonymous aspect of it. But I think we need to be there for each other, just like you just said, Dr. Beers. And thank you so much for your time, uh, for all you're doing and, and continue to do. Um, you know, we are so proud of you for your president-elect status for AAP and, and um, certainly all that you're doing at Children's and uh, wish you and your family the very best through all this. And to those watching, thank you for joining us be well, enjoy your holiday weekend and um, time with your families and uh, take care. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. All right. Thanks.